Hi there, this is Terry, and welcome to another episode of the Animation Industry Podcast. Robot Chicken, the stop motion sketch series from Adult Swim, first launched in 2005. Now, 15 years later, it's entering the big leagues of longest running animated shows like The Simpsons, Family Guy, and South Park as it nears its 200th episode in its 10th season on air, which is quite incredible, especially for a purely stop motion show. In fact, the second half of the season starts in just a week on June 28th, so make sure you catch all the new episodes. Now, in this chat, I bring on multiple primetime Emmy and Annie winning Matthew Senreich, who is the director, producer, and co-creator of Robot Chicken, to share what he did to get the series picked up by Adult Swim in the first place, how he's made it so successful over the years, and what goes into producing each episode from idea to execution. He's also going to give you some of the advice that he wish he had when he was trying to get Robot Chicken first picked up, as well as some practical tips to push your ideas out into the world. Now, without further ado, let's jump in. Hi, Matt. How are you doing? Thanks for coming on the chat. Thanks so much. I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, it's exciting. And you have some exciting news to share with, uh, you know, Robot Chicken hitting almost two, well, it's 200 episodes coming up. So how do you, how do you feel about that? It's, uh, it's extremely surreal, to be honest. Uh, I'm, uh, it makes me feel old. <laughs> it okay. really <really> does. <laughs> well, congratulations. Did you, did you ever think you'd get this far from the start? When, no, when did you actually come in on? Was it episode yeah. one? Yeah, I mean, Robot Chicken, we started... It was all by accident when we created this show. Uh, I don't think any of us expected uh, it to grow into what it is. And uh, I I'm just, yeah, I'm beyond excited that it it's lasted as long and that we have a fan base that has been beyond supportive. Yeah. So what do you mean by accident? Like you just happened to throw a bunch of like Barbie dolls in a <laughs> camera and out pop some it, parodies? <laughs> it really started where um, it started even before Adult Swim. Uh, Seth and I, you know, we were just trying to create a little short uh for him to go on the conan o'brien uh show with he was you know he had an action figure that come out and uh he wanted to make a little animated short and we started to figure out how to put something like that together and in the process of doing that um there was a company called uh sony screen blast which was adults well not adults when it was like youtube before youtube um was interested in creating more shorts than just that so we made it 12 animated shorts on dial-up uh, that probably no one ever saw back in like, I think it was 2000. So it was all by accident. We had other jobs. And then, you know, when Adult Swim ended up uh, buying the show, we had to figure out how to really make this show. Wait, um, so you were both working other jobs and then Adult Swim saw those those episodes that you put together and was like, guys, yeah, here's, much, here's yeah. a million dollars. Uh, <laughs> figure it out. <laughs> we always wanted to do something with these shorts and we didn't know what to do. So like... We had talked to Comedy Central. We had talked to like uh, Mad TV about doing like little interstitials in between. Um, and uh, we got introduced to Adult Swim because uh, we had pitched a Cartoon Network who said that it was too old for them. And at the same time, Seth MacFarlane, who had do done voices on our show, said, hey, there's this, you know, late night uh, block of programming called Adult Swim that's re-airing our Family Guy stuff. Uh, you should go meet with them because I think they're going to be doing original programming. So the combination of the two introduced us to Adult Swim. And uh, they, yeah, when we, we met with them, it was, it was like, it was just a kindred spirit. I, wa I want to talk more about the show, but I, I kind of want to go on this thread. <laughs> how, long, how long did that take from you creating for Conan O'Brien all the way to getting picked up by Adult Swim? Because, you know, you said in a few sentences, it sounds like yeah. it happened in a couple of weeks. No, no, we uh when we very first made those shorts, it was like two thousand to two thousand one. Um the episode or the short aired uh mid two thousand one. And then we started trying to sell it after that to another network. Um and it was probably I think we didn't sell it until like two thousand three, two thousand four was when it ended up selling to adults when I know we started making robot chicken in two thousand four um but yeah it, it took a while it took a, a long time so i guess my next question is what did you like learn from that experience that enabled you to really hit the nail on the head and sell it because you know you were trying every network that you thought would take it <laughs> nobody wanted it it was before you know it was before really adult animation was a thing also you have to remember and like it was before stop motion had had this revitalization um you know, the only people really doing it at that time was Comedy Central, 
which was very interested at the time. And we were really close to selling it to them. But uh, I, I hate saying it like this, but 9-11 happened in the process of talking to them. And nothing was funny for probably, you know, nine months. Uh, and by the time we got back to talking to them about doing something new, a lot of the people that we were speaking with were no longer with the company. They had moved on to other jobs. Uh, right. And it was around that time that we started and got introduced to these other avenues uh, to bring it to. Um, and uh, yeah, and then the, it just spiraled into this Adult Swim experience. So you're working full time and then yep. adult animation isn't a thing. And yep. you have this like a couple of shorts you put together. What gave you the confidence to say like, we're gonna go full forward with this versus what do people actually want? Let's create something that we think we can have an easy sell with. Cause you there's know, so many people like pushing ideas out there that are super confident and you know, they don't go anywhere, but then we get every once in a while, something like robot chicken. I, I think the easy sell words don't, didn't exist at that time. Um, you know, it, it was less confidence than it was um, when we showed it to people, the reaction was, you could see the genuine reaction of people. Um, and the reaction was, I don't know where this goes, but I love it. Um, and the fact that that existed, it was just, how do you find that avenue uh, to be able to show people something that you know people are liking? Um, you know, look, I make stuff still today and people are like, yeah, that's good, okay. You can see when someone actually reacts to something, but when people saw some of the stuff they did, it, it really, it, it was a genuine reaction and it makes you feel that like heartwarming feeling um, that there is something to this and you just don't know what to do with it. So it's okay. just exploring that pathway. That makes and sense. So other people are responding to it and, and because yeah, of that, course, yeah. There are so many avenues and that's what I always like to tell people even just like, who are working on their own stuff. There's so many avenues, especially now, to put your you know, content out into the marketplace. And you can see when something pops, especially even online. Um, we bring in writers who make things that you know, make something of their own and you just are like, wow, this person is amazing at what they do. Um, how can we bring this person to write for Robot Chicken? Nice. So, say, okay, so say you know, maybe I've made something that I'm proud of and I get response from people. What's the, what's the next step for me? Like, post it. Like, post it. Yeah, then what? You can put it out into the marketplace. Like, and then yeah, wait. Uh, I'll, I'll use. I love using like Rachel Bloom as a perfect example. Like, Rachel Bloom ended up writing for Robot Chicken. You can see, but she started and she had this video, um, this thing called "Fuck Me Ray Bradbury," which cracked us up in the writers' room, and we're like, "Who is this person?" Um, and brought her in. And she ended up going out and had these other ideas and ended up selling that crazy ex-girlfriend show. Same type of thing. But it's just being able to make yourself seen in that larger uh, way, you'll get a fan base. Gotcha. And, that, and that helps the bigger picture. Okay, makes sense. Um, so let's chat about Robot Chicken a little bit more. Um, so, you know, we're ha halfway through season 10. The next half is premiering June 28th, I guess. I think it already premiered, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, what, what can we look out for? Because you're 10 seasons in, like that's a huge accomplishment. What, what's keeping it fresh? Like what can we look out for that hasn't you know, been done before? It's, it's a sketch comedy show. And, you know, it's like saying, you know, what keeps Saturday Night Live or any sketch comedy show lively? It, it's, it's just about trying to take things that exist in pop culture and turn them on their side. The only difference between stuff like we do is we do it with action figures. Um, you know, we do it and, and it, we lean into nostalgia a lot, which I think helps, uh, helps it for the toy aspect, but we also are making fun of the stuff that's happening today. We also have original characters, uh, that we end up creating for the show, uh, in, in toyetic form. Um, so it, it's, it's just about doing that. And then it's bringing in younger, it's bringing in younger people, younger talent, uh, to help write for the show. You know, the stuff I grew up with was a lot of eighties property properties. It's, you know, Transformers, G.I. Joe, you know, Thundercats, things like that. But the people who are writing on our show right now, they grew up with things like DuckTales or Avatar or, you know, the Nicktoons in the 90s. And you can see the transition from, you know, our first few seasons to what our current seasons are and what the properties are that we're making fun of. Gotcha. Um, and yeah, I think that that helps the fan base, you know, 
be a lot younger than it started out being. So it's like there's effort to keep it constantly evolving and re relevant, I guess. So can you take me behind the scenes of how an episode actually goes through the process? Like, do you all sit uh, around a board table and come up with ridiculous jokes that you think are going to not make it through the censorship team? And <laughs> Um, I think today no one's allowed to sit around a boardroom table being that we live in. Okay, uh, okay fair. <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're right in the next season right now and it's, it's uh, everybody is on Zoom, but our, our, our process is a little weird. We, we write like four episodes in about four weeks. Um, we have a group of writers and for the first like two weeks, two and a half weeks, people are just writing crazy like just trying to come up with as many ideas as they can come up with. And then it the second half of the day, you sit down and you start going through those ideas and basically everybody's saying why you don't like everybody's idea. And it's, you, you find those gems uh, in that group uh, that you can then ultimately, for the last part of the, the process, you end up scripting. And that's where I think the group sits around a table and the writers sit around a table and they just start um, going line by line and trying to turn it into something that will end up on the show. How many of the... Like, do you get a lot of pushback on some of the vulgarity of, of the jokes that you make up? Um, yes and no. Uh, <laughs> we definitely push the envelope, um, you know, but our show is TVMA. So I think that helps. I think that the TV 14 versions that we've done, which are more the um, uh, specials, like our, our Star Wars or our DC specials, um, less so. But uh, yeah, again, uh, we, like, we like pushing the envelope. Nice. So from the stop motion side of things, uh, stop motion is not like a huge mainstream medium in television versus like 2D or 3D. So what are some of the challenges of doing everything in stop motion that, you know, the average animator out there might not be aware of because, you know, they're not involved in that. <laughs> We started the show and stop motion wasn't as viable back then. It, it was still like, it was a very small, close-knit community, even though it's still a, a small, close-knit community. It's grown a lot, especially in the last like five to 10 years. Um, but when we, you know, probably before Robot Chicken, it was Celebrity Deathmatch was the biggest thing uh, that it existed. Um, and, you know, you watch technology evolve. Um, the fact that I can have my son doing stop motion with Lego by using his iPad right now, it, it makes things a lot easier than having to get a toggle box, which was what was used to do the animation back in the day. And it was like lining it up to try to flip back and forth between frames. It, it made it really tricky. Um, the fact that you know we have 3D printers now uh, to be able to print all the hand shapes uh, that we can just pop on and off to make the different hand gestures. We didn't have 3D printers. We had to hand sculpt and you know do each one of those hands uh, all the time. It, it was it was a much different world that we lived in. Um, but I, I love watching where we've gotten to, and I love watching stop motion turn into something that's much greater because I love how it looks. Um, it, it's so tangible. It, it has depth to it. Like again. What I loved about doing this show with Seth from the beginning was we were bringing our toys to life. Like there was no 2D version of this show. It was about actually taking the toys we grew up with and making them come to life. How many people are actually involved in an episode? Because you know, you mentioned you have people crafting hands, you have the actual animators, et cetera. Like, so how big is the team? I mean, for Robot Chicken, it's probably like, Gosh, it might be like 75-ish kind of people. The, the, the issue to say that is, you know, I'm part of a company called Stupid Buddy Studios, yeah. and it's a much larger company. So people are working on multiple projects at once, uh, which is what makes it nice. So, um, you know, the company probably has about 250 people uh, working at it right now. And, you know, there's a ton of different projects from, you know, yeah. Crossing Swords, which just debuted on Hulu. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you can even see the Buddy Thunder Truck, which was on uh, Netflix. Like, we're all over the place, and it, it, it's great. Yeah, I'm a big I'm a big fan of Stupid Buddies. I've been following you guys. Well, I'm, I'm a stop motion guy, so I, I've well, been that's following awesome. you guys for so Why are we not seeing any of your stuff? You maybe have seen some of my stuff. I just, <laughs> you know. <laughs> are you posting it? Yeah. Okay, uh, we'll see some of this. All right, I'll, I'll send you some after this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm also in Canada, so there's a big, uh, uh, it's a huge 
community. difference <laughs> between geographical difference. Are you in Toronto? Yeah, I'm in Toronto. Yeah, yeah there's a big yeah, there's group a, up there. Yeah, and there's a big animation community here too, which has been running this podcast has been amazing. It's been eye-opening to get all the connections and see everything and stuff. So um, I want to chat about kind of your career and stuff too, because this podcast is, sorry? I just heard the about accent. Now oh I no, I swear I don't have it. <laughs> I want to chat about <laughs> your career too, because part of this podcast is about, you know, sharing the journeys of animation professionals careers. So you kind of shared how things started off for you, but you know, you've been doing Robot Chicken for 10 years and you're still developing your own stuff and, you know, Crossing Swords just came out, which you mentioned. Has it been easier to pitch and get, you know, work and stuff because of the track record and, and the connections you've had? Um, you know, I don't know. It's never easy. Um, I think it's always just about what the project really is um, to be able to make it happen. I think the thing that's become easier is that animation has evolved into something that is now popular uh, and popular to make. And there are a lot of different studios and networks that are looking to put it on their platforms. Um, again, I come back to when, when we first started Robot Chicken, there were maybe two places that you could sell. Um, to be able to say that I can go to like 10 to 12 different places to try to sell something, it really does open the chances uh, to be able to take a project out and take a big swing with it. Um, so, so I think it's a lot about that. I think it helps for us that we have a studio also to be able to produce something now. Um, so we're lucky in that way. Uh, but, but it's, it's always, it's always hard to try to find that project or that creative, um, idea that's going to be something that people are going to want to make sure they're going to want to see. Nice. So you mentioned, you know, you, you're a producer on, on the show, but you mentioned, you know, you're involved in writing and selling, like, what is your actual... Oh gosh, um, I'm all over the place. Uh, you know, we have four owners of this company. Um, we all do different types of things. I think it's, look, for Robot Chicken, I am in the writer's room and I am, you know, in the editing room a lot, trying to put it together. I put together the animat, like as much as I can do with, with Robot Chicken, as much as I want to step back, I'm still recording them. Um, I should take a step back, but I, I, it's hard to let go. Yeah. Um, so you're just walking around with a coffee and just like jump in, animate something here, go over there, write something I, here. I actually <laughs> haven't been on stages that much. Um, and and uh, just because there's a lot of the business side that I have to deal with uh, that takes time away. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then with other projects, you know, you get brought into different meetings and things like that and opinions. And it, it's a it's a real creative collective uh which i think is is nice about our our, our studio it, yeah. it's about playing with friends and you just want to help each other out the best you can you best you can so maybe like what are the what are the like top skills for somebody you know that wants to take on this kind of role or career path that they're going to need it sounds like uh it, like time management and <laughs> you know, <laughs> multitasking it, really starts, it, it starts with making something that's yours yeah. I think that's the most important thing. It's like, what is that passion project that you have? Because I, I go back to Robot Chicken. It was a passion project. It started with just Seth and I saying, this is something we want to do um, and finding the way to make it. Uh, you know, when we were doing this, look, we, we went to, we had no idea how to do animation when we started. Um, I went to, I worked in comic books at the time. Uh, I asked a couple people, they said there's an art school in New Jersey because I was in New York at the time. Uh, I went to the Joe Kubert school and talked to Joe and he introduced us to third year art students at the time. You realize, okay, art students can't do it because they're actually in school and it takes way more time than just like, hey, you can do this in a night. And it just was that slow rolling process of, okay, how do you put this whole piece of the puzzle together? And even when we did those shorts, we were making, and it was really stupid, we were making and building the actual um, actual sets in New York and FedExing them out to California. It's not the most efficient process. Like it, it, you look back and you're like, oh my God, we were so stupid back then. But it was, it really was just rolling up your sleeves and getting your hands dirty to make that thing that you love. So where does this drive, I, I mean, making a thing that you love, but is that, is that where the drive to pursuing this all comes from for you? 100%, yeah. And, and, look, and where does that, where does that originally come from? 
Um, if you're a creative person, you have it deep inside. Uh, you know, you, you always want to make something that's your story. Uh, what I love now, and I, I tell it to my kids, is they can make anything they want with this device, which I couldn't do. I had a VHS tape, you know, VHS thing that would roll back if I had stopped it and erased like a few frames or seconds of whatever it is that I just filmed. Um, I couldn't edit things together the way I can now on my computer. Um, yeah, it's just learning, learning the ways to do it yourself and then being able to utilize that to put the thing you love together. Nice. So maybe as, as we wrap up this chat, I know it's just a short chat, but what is, I guess, the piece of advice that you wish you had throughout all of this, given that, you know, you've been through ups and downs and selling your show and working on it for 10 years and et cetera, owning a studio. Like what, what is that thing that you wish somebody had told you earlier? Um, you know, that, that I wish they told me, I, I think it was just that I wasn't going to sleep. Um, <laughs> I realized that I wasn't going to sleep when I was starting up. Um, but no, I mean, as far as advice goes, uh, it's hard that, you, you know, it probably was that failing's okay. I think that's probably the biggest thing because I failed a lot. And I remember the times I failed and I learned from every one of them. I always go back to when I was starting to write, um, I was working in comics and there was, I was an intern uh, for a, a famous uh, comic book writer uh, named Jim Shooter. And he had his own, it was like Defiant and Broadway comics and Valiant he had. And I would intern there and I would always show him my writing. And he would always look at it and say how awful it was. And like what I was doing wrong and point out everything that was wrong. But at the end of the summer, he would always come back to me and he would say, the only reason I would tell you it's so bad is because then you worked harder and you made it better. And it was like the moment at the end of that summer where you're like, oh, I do have an ability. Like, it's not all as terrible as I started to feel like it was. I would overcome it and try harder and find the things. And I, I would do the things that I needed to do to make it better um, with structure or dialogue or whatever it might be. So, yeah, I always, I always look back at those experiences. Nice. That's a, that's a really like good story to share because you know when you receive negative feedback it, it hurts it does and, and you feel like giving up <laughs> always but again you still even today i get negative feedback yeah and it's what can i do to make it better there's a right. reason there's negative feedback where is it to yeah to overcome that nice well is there is there anything else you wanted to share uh as we as we wrap up our chat here oh gosh i just want to see your animation now <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> I will. I will send some to you. And uh, in the meantime, you thanks. Post it at the end of this, so we can all see it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, uh, thank you so much for coming on the chat, Matt. It's been a pleasure having you, and congratulations again on on uh, Robot Chicken hitting 200 episodes. That's awesome. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Okay. Bye.